Today's episode of Just the Tip Tuesday is brought to you by CK Worldwide, the standard in TIG welding. I want to give a huge shout out to CK for donating to my recent giveaway at the Kentucky Welding Institute High School Welding Competition. They're a huge supporter of welding education and the brand that I trusted long before they became a supporter of the show. CK leads the way in TIG welding innovation. From their silicon nitride cups to wedge collets, purge chambers, flex lock torches, and many more. If you're into TIG welding, regardless of alloy, CK has everything you need to make sure you're set up for success. Check them out today at ckworldwide.com. You can get all genuine CK Worldwide parts and accessories right through your local authorized CK dealership, which you can find by clicking on the Find a Dealer tab on the website. It's that easy. CK Worldwide, the standard in TIG welding. Now let's get into the show. gentlemen welcome to this week's episode of just the tip tuesday today is the 17th episode of just the tip so if you're just now tuning in go back and check out some of the previous episodes we've covered a lot of ground this year if you all have a question that you want answered on the show or a topic you'd like discussed you can always shoot me an email show at arcjunkies.com you can reach me on the dms on instagram at arcjunkies podcast or you can click on the send us a message button on the arc junkies website located at www.arcjunkies.com If I choose your topic, I'll go ahead and send you out a free Arc Junkie sticker pack and give you credit on the show. Today's question was submitted via the website, arcjunkies.com, by Brett Andrushak. Brett asks, can you discuss torch cutting tips like setup and how to pick what size to use for the task at hand? Brett, this is honestly a great question. I've been to three different welding schools and I had several years of experience in the field before I ever learned you can actually select the right tip based on the work that you were doing. It wasn't until I actually got into teaching and I had my local gas distributor, Robert's Oxygen, come by and give a class that I learned that there was so much more to cutting than I had originally thought. I mean, this is a very intense subject. But to answer your question, your tip selection should always be based off the thickness of the material you're trying to cut. Now, tip sizes range anywhere from a triple lot or zero, zero, zero up to a number eight for specialty cutting. And this numbering system is going to vary a little bit depending on the tip manufacturer. Everybody's got different part numbers, but I mean, those are pretty much the sizes. The most common sizes you're going to be dealing with, like I said, is probably a triple lot, which is zero, zero, zero up to a number one for handheld cutting. Once we get up into like a number two, you're probably running some sort of mechanized torch setup and you you got additional preheating heads and it's for, you know, thicker materials. One important thing to remember is that these numbers, the smaller the number, the thinner the material we can actually cut. So for instance, a triple lot tip is recommended for cutting around eighth inch material. A double lot tip or two zeros, that's going to be good for cutting up to quarter inch plate. And a zero or an aught would be ideal for three eighths to half inch material. And a number one tip is going to be recommended for three quarter inch plate. And then a number two, that's going to be ideal for cutting one inch thick material. As I said, each manufacturer is going to vary slightly on the thicknesses for the tip sizes. Also, we need to consider our fuel gas. Often our acetylene will have a different tip number than propane or other natural gases. The best resource I've found is the manufacturer's website. So if your place of business uses Victor, head on over to the ESOB website. If you're using Harris at work, go to the Harris website. And Flame Tech, you're going to do the same thing. Head on over to their website. That's honestly the best way I've found to get the most accurate information based off of the type and brand of tip that I'm actually going to be using for the work. Now, some of these companies actually have little cards. Uh, You can email them or you can pull it up on the website, print them off, laminate them, put them up in your toolbox. Uh, They'll have a card that says, hey, you know, like here's the tip size here. Here's how much oxygen you should use or here's how much acetylene or if you're using a natural gas or propane, they'll have those pressures listed as well. So go ahead, check those out. Uh, There's some great resources. I like to have them in the class just as a handy reference to pass out to the students so they understand, you know, when they're cutting, you know, three-eighths plate on a bevel, they use this number. Or if we're cutting some sheet metal, eighth-inch material, they should probably use, you know, this tip size. And here's the settings for it. Another important thing to consider is the angle of the cut. So let's say I'm cutting out some half-inch plate at a 30-degree bevel. 
I might want to step up to a number one tip. Now, an ought tip is ideal for half-inch plate, which we've already discussed. But now that I'm cutting on an angle, it's essentially increasing the thickness or the cut because of that angle. So at 90 degrees, it's half inch. But maybe, you know, once I get to that 30 degree mark, I'm probably closer to a three quarter inch thickness of material. So I'm going to want to step up to a number one tip on that. Now, most places I've worked, I didn't have a great tip selection. So you really have to learn to use what you have access to. I've cut some thicker material with smaller tips by just increasing my oxygen pressure, increasing my preheat time, and decreasing my cutting speed. So I'm going to be cutting a lot slower. I've also cut some really thin materials with large tips by pushing at a very steep angle and going fast across the material. However, if our objective is to cut for quality and accuracy, I'm going to want to pick the right tip size based off the material thickness that I'm going to be using. And if I have access to those tips, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to stop, swap that tip out, and you know, use that tip based off the, uh, the thickness of the material that I plan to cut. Now, if I'm cutting things apart for scrap or demo or making a rough cut so I can just get that piece of material into the shop to then cut it down to a more accurate size, kind of use what you got at your disposal. Jason Marburger with Fireball Tools actually does a great video on showing how, how to use a, a larger tip to cut thinner material because a lot of time, especially in iron work, you know, if you're up on a beam or something, you're trying to cut something out, you don't have access to a bunch of different cutting size tips and you just need to make a rough cut to get something to fit or, you know, get a piece to uh, go into a certain spot, you know, so you can, you can kind of get away with technique if you don't have the correct tip size for what you're trying to do. Not saying that that's, you know, a common practice or you should do that all the time. Like I said, I recommend using the right tip for the right size material thickness, but sometimes you get into a pinch and you don't have what you need on hand. Again, one thing to consider is that each manufacturer should have a chart available for this stuff, and that chart's going to outline the thickness of the material you need to cut and then reference you to the tip size you should be using. Additionally, it's going to tell you cutting pressure for oxygen and the fuel gas, you know, depending on what type of gas that you're using for your system. I've seen this many times, and I've done it on more than one occasion, where I just set the, set the fuel gas, like most of the time I use acetylene, somewhere around 6 to 10 and then I just triple the amount of oxygen. So if I'm running, let's say, 10 on my acetylene, I'll crank up my oxygen to 30. And those pressures kind of usually get me by. Yes, the majority of the time it's going to work for acetylene. But if I switch over to propane or other natural gases, it's a completely different rule. So don't base it, you know, because they're going to have different ratios. So you want to make sure you refer back to those charts. And like I said, you print these charts off one time, you put them in the toolbox, you start referencing them all the time, you're going to start committing this stuff to memory. You won't need the chart anymore. Or if you do, it's, you know, you get that resource over there in the toolbox. Of all the different fuel gases available, acetylene is probably, in my opinion anyway, the most common used in the majority of the shops. And that's, like I said, that's from my experience. But it's also the most volatile and it requires specific use and handling. Acetylene actually has a porous lining on the inside that contains acetone. That acetone helps keep the acetylene stable. So anytime we're running acetylene, we want to make sure that our pressure is less than 15 pounds per square inch. So you can actually see it right there on the gauge, especially on acetylene. Uh, there's, there's a red bar that starts right at 15. And that basically tells you, hey, don't run this any higher than 15 PSI. Because if we do, that acetylene starts to become unstable. In addition, we want to make sure that we run the bottle in the upright position. So a lot of times you'll see bottles tilted on the side or something like that, you know, going down the road or in a shop, uh, you know, if, if it's on like a, a rack or a system, you want to make sure for acetylene anyway, that that bottle is in the upright position before you use it. If that acetylene has been on its side for any period of time, you're going to want to stand that bottle up. You're going to want to let it settle. I recommend a minimum of two hours, let it settle, let all that liquid acetone seep back into the bottom of that cylinder before trying to use that that can, or that uh, that cylinder of acetylene. That's just going to prevent any liquid acetone from coming up into the regulator, the torch hoses, or the torch itself. Acetone is going to destroy any rubber O-rings in the system. So, I mean, if you think about what do we use acetone for? We use to, to clean stuff up. Uh, if you want to get rid of sticker residue or anything like that, you wipe it down with acetone. Acetone is going to be really harsh on anything that's rubber. So, if it comes in contact with your O-rings, guess what? It's going to degrade the integrity of your O-ring. Next thing you know, you got leaks. You don't want this stuff in your regulator. 
Uh, it's going to tear that up as well. So make sure anytime you use acetylene, make sure it's been standing upright for at least two hours prior to use. You'll know that uh, you're drawing liquid acetone into your system if at any time you're getting a purple flame anywhere on your, your torch. You can automatically tell you're pulling acetone in that situation. So at that point, you know, shut it down, let everything sit, make sure, you know, you can start taking things apart, smelling them. Acetone has a really sour smell to it. Uh, you'll be able to tell if you got liquid acetone on your O-rings or anything like that because they're going to start getting sticky. At that point, you're going to want to switch everything out. But best practice, keep that thing upright. Don't use it anytime it's been laid down on the side. Let it stand up for about two hours. Now, one thing that may be obvious for many people out there, but may not be so obvious for a lot of others because we have a lot of hobbyists that listen to the show, a lot of people just getting into welding. So OxyFuel, that process can only be used to cut on ferrous materials, most, you know, meaning that they contain iron. So this process is, is pretty much limited to carbon steels or mild steel or any, any type of, any grade of steel. Now you can melt aluminum apart and you can heat up stainless pretty good, but you can only make accurate cuts on steel. Oxyfuel cutting, it's actually a chemical reaction. It's an essentially an accelerated rusting process. So don't try to use it to cut aluminum, stainless, or any other non-steel materials. If, it's, uh, if you can get a magnet to stick to it pretty good, oxyacetylene is going to cut it just fine. Now, like I said, you can melt away aluminum. You can melt thin uh, stainlesses away, but it's not, it's not going to be pretty. You're not, you're not going to want to weld on it once you're done because it's, it's going to look like crap. I was actually set out to a, a job site one time where I had to cut up a big aluminum frame and just throw it in the throw it in the recycling bin. That's all I had to do. Cut it up, throw it in the recycling bin. And they sent me out there with an oxyacetylene torch to do it. And it was a pain in the ass. I got it done, but it was it was not pretty. I think a sawzall would have been much more effective. Uh, but that's the tool that my uh, my boss sent me out to the field with. And he said, hey, go cut up that frame up there. I don't know if he knew it was aluminum or not, but... I melted the shit out of it and uh, and scrapped it. So I, I made it happen, you know, and it paid by the hour. So I wasn't too concerned about it taking a little bit more time than it needed to. Now, cutting tips, they're not the only type of tips that we have available for the OxyFuel system. We also have welding and brazing tips. There's flush cut tips. There's uh, gouging tips. And there's preheated tips called rosebuds. Again, all these different tips, their sizes, their numbering system for, you know, based off material thickness and the types of fuel gas that you're going to be using, those are all going to be on the chart. So once again, you're going to want to consult the manufacturer to see which tip is best for you for what you want to accomplish with that tip. One big thing to keep in mind when you're working with a rosebud and you're using acetylene, you need to make sure that that tip can be fueled by the size of the acetylene tank that you have. I've seen this a bunch of times and I've done it myself, you know, a couple times, more times than I'd care to admit prior to learning what I learned about this stuff. So when you use a rosebud, you want to make sure you're not pulling more acetylene than the bottle can handle per hour. What do I mean by that? Well, we can't safely withdraw more than 10% of the cylinder's capacity per hour. Well, each tip size is going to pull a different amount of fuel gas. So say, for instance, a number six rosebud, it's going to pull anywhere from 14 to 40 cubic feet per hour of acetylene. If we look on the top of our acetylene tank, it should have the cubic feet listed on it. Now, this is typically on a little label or a sticker, or sometimes it's done in paint marker. So let's say on top of uh, my acetylene tank, it says 335 cubic feet. I can only safely withdraw 10% of that cylinder's capacity per hour. So 10% of that 335 cubic feet is 33.5 cubic feet. So that's all I can pull out per hour. So going back to that rosebud, 15 to 40 cubic feet, I can run that. But if I step up to a number eight, you know, that might be, I think it's 40 to 80 cubic feet per hour, I can't use that. What's going to happen is I'm going to starve that torch, meaning the torch doesn't have enough fuel gas and it's going to attempt to find more fuel gas. So the torch will, usually it'll pop and then it'll squeal and it'll start to get hot. And that's because the flame is trying to go back inside of the torch to find more fuel gas. So to avoid this, we need to make sure we're not pulling more than that 10% that I, I recommended earlier. So to fix this, we need to either drop down on the tip size. So, you know, like I said, a number six for this situation would work. So if I have a number eight, I need to drop down to a number six. Uh, if you have a smaller tank, you might need to go from a number six to a number four, or I need to get a bigger tank. So maybe I step up from uh, a 335 to like a 625. 
So just some things to, to consider to prevent this from happening to you. Because what's going to happen is you're going to destroy your torch. If you don't have the right uh, check valves or um, flashback arresters, that, that fire is going to start rolling through your torch. And it's going to try and go and get inside of that bottle to get more gas because it's starving. That flame wants to keep moving. You know, we need three things to make that, that happen, right? We need heat, oxygen, and a fuel source. And if, it's, if we're starving it from, of that fuel source, it's going to go inside the torch and try to find it. Now, I actually did a 45-minute video on Weld.com a couple years ago that outlines everything from setup to use to breakdown and all the safety in between on the oxyacetylene system. It's a very comprehensive video, and it's the class that I teach or I used to teach to all my students as we got into oxyfuel cutting. So if you just go over to YouTube, type in uh, oxyfuel cutting, it should pop right up. It's a great video, and it's super in-depth on all things related to the oxyfuel cutting process, as well as um, flush cuts and rosebuds and all that information. So, Brett, I hope that answers your question. Essentially, you know, we're, we're going to base the tip size off of the material thickness that we're trying to cut. And as I said at the start of the show, if you all have any questions you want answered or a topic you want covered, just hit me up. Uh, like I said, you can reach me via email, show at arcjunkies.com. You can send me a DM on Instagram at Podcast. You can send me a message through the Arc Junkies website, arcjunkies.com. You know, just hit me up anyway, and I'd be more than happy to address your topics or your questions. And I'll also send you a free sticker pack. Hope you guys have a great rest of your week. Stay safe out there. And until next time, Make every well better than your last.